and some of the experiences that uh, led him to us this morning. And so, Dr. Marbury, let's see if we might be able to pick up where we left off and to have you to start talking about uh, African-Americans and the institutional church from your perspective. Well, I think what's foundational for the, for the institutional church for African-Americans and perhaps foundational for most churches, but particularly for black churches, is the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, you find it... Uh, in the pulpits, uh, we preach from it. We, it, it is our authority for, for our moral life. And it is for most Christian communities, the word of God. And I tell my students uh, every time they step into a pulpit in the midst of a community of believers and they speak from the Bible, they are speaking for that community. Good. What is the word of God? And so one of the things that, that um, captured my attention when I was a student at ITC and then later at, 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 uh, at Vanderbilt, I uh, had good professors like Professor Victor Anderson and Professor Lewis Baldwin, uh, who interest me not only in ethics, that is, that is how black communities think about what's right and wrong, but also interested me in the history of the black church. Um, and from that standpoint, I wanted to, st I wanted to know, well, why? Why do black churches, why do churches in general think of the Bible and use the Bible so differently? For example, you, you look in Nashville and you've got churches from one end of the city to the other. And on fundamental issues, we disagree. And yet the same book is being preached from our pulpits. And I began to, I began to wonder, well, what's going on? It's not the book. The book is the same. Mm -hmm. What's going on the way that we interpret these it's texts? It's the interpretation of Absolutely. these books. Absolutely. Exactly. The and mm -hmm. so I wanted to study how African Americans historically mm -hmm. have interpreted the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the reason I, put the, I, I wrote Pillars of Cloud and Fire. Mm -hmm. um, it begins to look at, it begins to look at African American biblical interpretation mm -hmm. from the antebellum period, Good. starting with, starting with slavery. And I look mm -hmm. at, I look at various examples an example, a radical example, and a conservative example mm -hmm. in, in the antebellum period, beginning with um, Absalom Jones okay. and David Walker. Mm -hmm. I move on to look at Reconstruction with um, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper mm -hmm. and John Jasper. Mm -hmm. The Harlem Renaissance where, with um, Zora Neale Hurston. Mm -hmm. Then the era of civil rights with um, Adam Clayton Powell and Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. And finally, I look at the era of black power with Albert Clegg. Mm -hmm. Each, each one takes up the book of Exodus, mm -hmm. but takes it up in a very different way. And they take it up based on what I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. That is, what are the relevant challenges mm -hmm. that my community faces? Mm -hmm. How can I continue to make the word of God, the Bible, mm -hmm. relevant? And so during, during the uh, antebellum period, Absalom Jones and David Walker both take up the story of Exodus almost literally, mm -hmm. that if God delivered the children of Israel Good. from Egypt across yeah. the Red Sea mm -hmm. into the promised land. Then God. Then God will do the same. <laughs> and the promised land was freedom from slavery. Mm -hmm. Well, freedom from slavery came mm -hmm. and we weren't free. Mm -hmm. uh, we faced Jim Crow and segregation. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to, to the era of reconstruction, uh, the pr and you look at sermons, the promised land doesn't, doesn't look like freedom from slavery. Emancipation is no, longer, mm -hmm. is, no, is no longer identified with the promised land. Mm -hmm. Uplift is, well, how do, we, how do we educate now? How do we move from just emancipation to education and the kind of cultural attainment that will lift black communities? Mm -hmm. And after, after Reconstruction, that changes again in the Harlem Re Renaissance, this mm -hmm. idea that we need to throw off the manacles of slavery, the old, the old Southern sort of African-American rebirth and a rebirth. That's, that's right. right. The Renaissance yes. man, mm -hmm. uh, Renaissance man, Renaissance woman. But for the Harlem Renaissance writers, for the most part, mm -hmm. except for Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. they were really thinking rather in, in sexist terms. So mm -hmm. they were thinking the new Negro was mm -hmm. a new Negro man. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, but but Zorno Hurston, I thought, was one of the most interesting figures during that time. Her Moses, Man of the Mountain, um, re helped African Americans rethink the Exodus story in a way that took the focus off a singular figure, like a Moses figure, and put it on the community. 
and asked us to imagine together what it would, what it would mean if we all together walked into the promised land and we weren't waiting for or dependent upon one singular figure or God to send one person to deliver a whole group of people. Um, and then I go on to look at the era of civil rights with Adam Clayton Powell and Martin Luther King Jr who understood the Exodus story in the promised land as being, mm. as being included as full citizens, mm. that we would certainly enjoy, as Dr. Martin Luther King would say, the blessings of liberty. And, and if you look at his speeches, he takes the rhetoric from the Constitution and the Declaration mm. of Independence, the kind of rhetoric that, that founded our nation, mm. and he connects it to the Exodus story. And freedom means becoming a full citizen. Mm. Um, well, after, at, at a certain point, after, after the, by the end of the Civil Rights mm -hmm. Movement, we find that Adam, that um, Albert Clegg mm -hmm. wants to do something very different with that. Mm -hmm. That there's the frustration uh, that has arisen because African Americans still aren't enjoying the blessings of liberty. Mm -hmm. There is a move to take that story and to claim it for ourselves and to claim the power to change mm -hmm. our lives. Uh, not that power, uh, but, but not placing it in the founding documents, but placing it in black communities themselves. And so we get the black power movement. So I wanted to look at the various ways that we have interpreted one singular book, the book of Exodus, over the course of a long period of time. But my, my, my concern was to show that each interpreter started first with the concerns of their community at that time. And I, and I wanted to encourage uh, my students who were, who were going to serve churches and serve in religious communities to do the same. You know, <clears throat> during this uh, second segment, I mean, the final mm -hmm. segment, mm -hmm. what I would like for you to do is to, uh, and I think you've mentioned uh, Adam Clayton Powell mm -hmm. and Dr. Martin Luther King. I, yeah. I think that these are two giants, yeah. but I think that people know more about uh, Dr. King mm -hmm. than they do about Adam Clayton Powell. Mm -hmm. And so during this second, uh, this final segment, when we come back, we've got about uh, 45 or 50 uh, seconds here. But when we come back during this uh, final segment, what I'd like for you to do, and I say this now because I don't want to forget uh, right. to, to push it forward. I want you to talk about Dr. Martin Luther King and Adam Clayton Powell and with emphasis up on Adam Clayton Powell and why he sh is significant and what the things that you've been doing. All okay. Right. And so what we'll do, we'll take this uh, final uh, final commercial break and then we'll come back and we'll deal with uh, some right. aspects of Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King and Adam Clayton Powell and we'll be back with our audience following this very very short commercial break. You look like you've been doing this all your life I man. I got it. Uh, no, this is my yeah, first time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, you yeah, you good? Because you got the information. That's what makes yeah. you good. See, when you have the information, and uh, yeah. you can do it. Yeah. See, you. and so when we come back to in this uh, final segment, I'll introduce the uh, show again. Oh. But uh, and, and in case I forget, but what I'd like for you to do is to look at these two personalities oh. in the context of all the things that you've studied about them and writing your book. Uh, and, and books and et cetera, and to look and, and to examine those two individuals, Dr. Martin Luther King and Adam Clayton Powell, and point out whatever the similarities or difficulties and et cetera, whatever you want to talk about. But I, I, I think that that would be good to end this because these are the two most important individuals <clears throat> in terms of contemporary black uh, society and uh, the uh, uh, institutional church. You see, and I'd like to know more about the, you know, about this myself. You see. And so when we come back, we'll do that. Right. We'll, be, uh, we'll do this. We'll have, <coughs> excuse me, we'll have 10 minutes to do this. I need some water myself. Yeah. <coughs> okay, very good. Thank you, now. Herbert Marbury. Yes, that's okay. it. Okay, well, you know, I have to do that every time. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving us some excellent, and I don't make too, I don't want to make any noise. I mean. Thank you, and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. 
We're talking to Dr. Herbert Marbury from Vanderbilt University, and he's giving us some information in reference to African Americans and the institutional church. Uh, Doctor, let's see if we might be able to pick up during this final segment to uh, talk about uh, what I consider to be two very, very significant individuals that you've already mentioned, uh, Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King and Adam Clayton Powell. And let's see what you uh, know about those individuals and how they fit into what we're trying to do at, at this particular time. Right. Well, in uh, the chapter on the Civil Rights Movement, I take up uh, Dr. King and Adam Clayton Powell as a pillar of cloud and fire. Dr. Um, Dr. King as a pillar of cloud mm -hmm. uh, and, Dr., uh, and, and Adam Clayton Powell as a pillar of fire. And when, when I say pillar of fire, I mean someone who kind of brandished, if you will, uh, his, his, his brashness, a boldness, a certain <laughs> radical nature. Uh, Adam Clayton Powell was uh, very clear in while he was in Congress mm -hmm. that he called himself the baddest Negro in Congress. Yeah, yeah. Go on right. and, then, <laughs> and, and he he flouted the rules. Mm -hmm. He didn't stomach segregation. Uh, he didn't take kindly to the kinds of the kinds of conventions mm -hmm. that um, that that made African Americans second class. Mm -hmm. And 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 part it had to do with his upbringing. Had to do with who he was. Um, but it also had to do with I think growing up in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And uh, be, he really was, I call him, uh, a son of the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. He was the new Negro, uh, as mm -hmm. I understand it, Good. that the Harlem Renaissance writers had hoped for. Mm -hmm. um, he started the first, uh, the first, one of the first boycotts uh, of, the, um, of, 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 the, um, of the public transportation system mm -hmm. in Harlem, uh, one of the first uh, sort of public service programs for, at, at his church, at Abyssinia, mm -hmm. uh, Abyssinian uh, Baptist, Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it, and by the time he, was, he went to Congress, he was pastoring the largest Protestant congregation in the nation. Um, Adam Clayton Powell is known for his, um, he's not only known for, for his pastoral work, but he's known for the Powell Amendment, mm -hmm. which was, which was a, a, a little known sort of codicil that he mm -hmm. would add to every bill that, um, that, that, that sent funding uh, for, for, public, uh, for, for public accommodations. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, it was a bill that said if, that, that public funding could not be used for segregated institutions. Mm -hmm. It angered seg Southern segregationists mm -hmm. throughout the country, but it also angered African Americans mm -hmm. because some of those schools were African American schools in the South, although mm -hmm. they were segregated, they were they were also they were starved mm -hmm. <laughs> because they also needed the public mm -hmm. funding. Mm -hmm. But Clayton Powell, and Clayton Powell didn't care. What he was concerned about was ensuring that those who wanted segregation had to pay for it, mm -hmm. and so he starved them all to death mm -hmm. until he was able to get the, the Civil Rights Bill in 1964. Mm -hmm. That was his victory mm -hmm. in, uh, in the the Civil Rights Bill of '64. <laughs> Um, he was there when uh, ba ba Lyndon Baines Johnson signed it, and s but so was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. And King, who was, uh, now these, they were both princes of the Black Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. um, Clayton Powell had um, gone to, um, had, um, you know, attended uh, school in New York. Mm -hmm. um, his father, uh, his, his father in many ways had groomed him to be a prince of the Baptist church. Uh, Martin Luther King. As Dr. King. As Dr. King's father. <laughs> Good. Both Good. His, father, uh, um, his father pastored Abyssinian, mm -hmm. while Dr. King's father pastored Ebenezer. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they both groomed their sons for, for the roles that they would mm -hmm. take. Mm -hmm. uh, they both went to, um, went, went to elite schools, uh, mm -hmm. Morehouse College in the South, and they both were products of the black middle class. Mm -hmm. But where they differed, I think, was um, Mother K Dr. King grew up in the segregated South, uh, born right at, at um, in 1929, uh, just as, as, as America was going into the Great Depression. And um, Dr. King saw a different and a brutal side of white segregationist Good. power. Um, and it was something that I don't think Adam Clayton Powell saw. That shaped Dr. King mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> in a way that, it prob that, that Adam Clayton Powell didn't And get. led to his assassination. Yes, mm -hmm. and, led to, and mm -hmm. led to his assassination, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a sense, both of them were assassinated. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. King, uh, literally. Good. Uh, Adam Clayton Powell was 
politically destroyed because of his brashness. Mm -hmm. um, so what I find with, um, now, both of them come at a time when African Americans have, have migrated. And I think this is also important mm -hmm. to make the making mm -hmm. of these two figures. Um, African Americans began to migrate immediately after, um, after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, every 10 years, you look at the census, you see more and more African Americans mm -hmm. migrating toward the West and toward mm -hmm. the North, what you, uh, except for the 10 years during the Depression when you don't see much mm -hmm. migration. But you see, and so African Americans migrated from rural communities in the South to, um, to um, cities in the South like Montgomery and Atlanta that created the possibility for a Montgomery bus boycott, mm -hmm. but also created the possibility for an Abyssinian Baptist church, which, which was Adam Clayton Powell's political base, mm -hmm. and which became for Martin Luther King mm -hmm. the base for the Montgomery bus boycott mm -hmm. and Ebenezer. Mm -hmm. And so um, as these two figures began to interpret the biblical text, uh, they began to, they thought of, they thought of the Exodus story at, for, um, for Adam Clayton Powell, the Exodus story guaranteed for African Americans uh, in, his, in, his, uh, in his sermon, Stop Blaming Everyone Else, which he, um, uh, which he preached at Abyssinian Baptist Church in the 50s. is a sermon that invited African Americans to fully participate mm -hmm. in what it meant to be a citizen, take responsibility for what it meant to be a citizen. He, he really pushed African Americans. He pushed mm -hmm. African Americans mm -hmm. to take responsibility mm -hmm. for it. Um, and so for Martin Luther King Jr., however, uh, there was a different way of understanding the biblical text. Martin Luther King Jr., um, he, growing up in the South, um, personal piety became very important in as much as his political work, personal piety became a mask, if you will, mm -hmm. for Martin Luther King Jr. He, he knew that if he was, if he was leading African Americans out to, to, um, into the streets to demand full inclusion, he knew how to use the television cameras, mm -hmm. how to use the public square, and mm -hmm. the way he used it was to lead African Americans into acts of personal piety. That's what mm -hmm. I call the pillar of cloud. Mm -hmm. He masked, he, in many ways, his mm -hmm. real intentions. Mm -hmm. He would lead them to pray in the streets, to sing songs. Mm -hmm. And when the television cameras came and they saw African Americans living out some of the, you know, th these kind of virtuous, represent these mm -hmm. virtuous expressions, right? Mm -hmm. Singing church mm -hmm. songs, praying, holding hands, praying for their enemies. Uh, not only was the, na the, the South was embarrassed, the nation mm -hmm. was embarrassed, but they were not only embarrassed domestically, they were embarrassed internationally. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, I call that the pillar of cloud because as a, just as a cloud kind of blends in seamlessly, mm -hmm. uh, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King's tactics blended in with mm -hmm. the American uh, moral landscape. Mm -hmm. These were virtues for America. And this mm -hmm. was also mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Martin Luther King behind the veil. Yes. And you know more about that because yes. of uh, one of your uh, professors, I'm yes. sure. Dr. Baldwin. Uh, doc, Dr. Baldwin, right. who talked about right. that and et cetera. And I think that yes. you're an, an excellent reflection yes. in terms of uh, what he said about that and some of the things that you're saying yes. about that. And I want you to know that uh, the information that you're giving us now is, is, is very, very precious. Right. And I think that uh, uh, understanding these two individuals right. and some of the things that they faced and how different they were one from the north and one from the, the south, south. Yeah. but yet and still they had the same commitment and, and, and while they went about it differently, mm -hmm. they had the same commitment in terms of the uplift of African Americans to eventually what? Reach the promised land. Right. And, and I think that that's what we're still trying to move toward. And that's, what, that, mm -hmm. that's what we're still trying. That's what I hope that as you read my book, but as, as we think about biblical interpretation mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. we, we face police shootings of African, black and brown, mm -hmm. African American and mm -hmm. Hispanic, uh, unemployment, high uh, underemployment, and questions around whether or not we can provide adequate mm -hmm. education and health care. And I want to know, why is it that we have to go out into the streets mm -hmm. to hear the word of God that black lives matter? Mm -hmm. Why not in the church? Mm -hmm. Now, to, to be sure, there's some churches who are mm -hmm. doing that. But my question is, how do we interpret the Bible in ways that are relevant for us? Very good. Let me thank you, uh, yes. Dr. Doing this last few seconds for coming by and giving us that thank excellent you. information. And let me encourage you to tune in again next week for another information.